بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Today we are going to discuss a very important topic in pediatrics which is growth and development. This lecture is supposed to be for the fifth year medical students and the postgraduate pediatricians. However, parents may find it beneficial. To my mind, I think the best way to study this topic is through questions and answers. So, this is the pretest to check your concepts about growth. Please read the questions, answer, and keep the answer in your mind, and re-answer again at the end of the lecture. The first question is regarding teething and walking. Which start first, teething, walking, or they start together? The second question, the head-body ratio in the new is larger in newborn, child, or adult. Which grow faster in the first year of life? The weight, the height, or the same? What is the most critical period of growth and development? Is it the first month, the first two years, or the twelfth year of life? The most important parameter for growth is weight for age, height for age, or weight for height. Keep the answer in your mind to be re-answered again after the lecture. The first question and the most important one, why this topic is important? Simply speaking, the human beings are a human body doing certain wise activities, eating, talking, walking, thinking, reproducing. However, the greatest activity to be done is to be an obedient slave for the God. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون صدق الله العظيم. So this is an important formation of the human body. This is the growth. Acquiring the skills for these activities, this is the development. So it is an important. Simply speaking, growth and development is the life. Let us start from the early beginning, the life, the life journey. Each one, each female has an ovary which will produce an ova, and this ova is picked up by the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube to stay in the outer one-third, waiting for the sperm. Once the sperm fertilizes the ova, the zygote will emerge. This zygote is the first cell in the human body. Formation of billions of such cells, this is the growth. Acquisition of skills later on, this is the development. So some cells are grouped together to function at the liver, other cells are grouped together to function at the heart, and so on. So growth, simply, this is an increase in the size of the organism due to increase in the number and the size of its constituent cells. And the development is acquisition of skills. The most important point here is that the growth and the development go simultaneously, go hand in hand together, starting from conception till death. This is the physical growth, this is the definition. Why all are different? We usually notice that those of North America and in Europe are taller and bigger than those in the southeastern Asia. What is the difference? Why these differences are there? These differences are there because of multiple factors affecting the growth and affecting the development. It is either congenital or environmental factors. Regarding congenital factors, this is an important point here to elaborate. This is, there is a difference between congenital and hereditary. Congenital is a broader term than hereditary. Congenital defect, congenital factor, is that we have a newborn infant with this problem, a newborn infant with this uh, stage of development. What are the causes behind this? Either from the early beginning, hereditary factors, the problem within the sperm or in the ova, or the problem was the intrauterine period. So congenital, either hereditary or non-hereditary. Hereditary factors, genetic, racial, age, and sex, may have an effect. And non-hereditary factors, including the intrauterine factors. Environmental factors, including the postnatal environmental factors regarding nutrition, physical factors, and the seasonal factors. Another important question, uh, the rate of growth, is it uniform throughout life? It is not. There are two spurts in our life with increasing growth rate. The first spurt in the, in the second year of life, and the second spurt is near adolescence. Important area, stages of growth to know about terminology. There are intrauterine period and extrauterine period. The intrauterine period are classified to different stages, embryonic period in the first trimester, early fetal period in the second trimester, late fetal period in the third trimester. Each period has its hazardous factors and the effect is different from period to period. The extrauterine period, this is a very important to us as a pediatrician. 
neonatal period, the first 28 days of life. So now I'm talking about a newborn, I'm talking about an infant in the first 28 days of life. Then infancy, in the first two years of life, further classified into early infancy in the first year and late infancy in the second year. Childhood from the second year to the 12th year of life, further classified into early childhood or preschool children from two to six years old and school age children from six to 12 years old. Then another period, which is adolescence. Adolescence is another period, usually from the 12 years old to 15 years old. This period is an important critical period because it is characterized by rapid physical, rapid physiological, and psychological changes. These adolescents, this period, during these periods, there is what's called the puberty. So adolescents differ from puberty. Puberty, at any time during the adolescence, the males had the spermatogenesis and the females has an oogenesis. Then later on, the adulthood from 15 to 18 years old. This is the classification we usually use in the pediatrics to know the ter different terminology. But there is another classification, the Americans usually use it, what's called toddler. And there is a, a very common disease, what's called the toddler diarrhea. What, does the, what do they mean by toddler? Toddler is the late infancy and the early childhood. So I'm talking about toddler, I'm talking about a child or an infant from one to three years old. These are the terminology. So uh, when we are going to discuss, when, going to, uh, when we are going to talk about infant or childhood and adolescence, we know the critical period and the period we are talking about. The, the, the mainstay for this topic is what are the growth domains? This is a very important. Growth domains, growth aspects, growth parameters, to answer the commonly asked questions by the, by the parents. Does my child grow normally or my child grow poorly? To answer these questions, I have to know the aspects, the area to be assessed. And each area to be assessed, I have to know the normal, which is normal and which is abnormal to answer these questions, which is the very important questions and commonly asked questions. This figure shows the assessment of growth or the aspects of growth or the domains of growth. We have four main domains of growth. The fontanelles, teething, anthropometric measures, which is the most important, then osseous growth. We'll talk about the most important one, which is the anthropometric measures, and come back again to the other domains. What's meant by the anthropometric measures? A very important area, because the pediatrician is said to be a measuring doctor, usually using a stethoscope and using the meter simultaneously to measure. Measure what? Measure the weight measure the height, measure the head circumference, measure the mid-arm circumference. These are the most important areas to be measured and to be assessed. We'll come first to the weight. This figure, as you see, the weight. The birth weight is usually from 3 to 3.5 kilograms at birth. At the age of 4 months, this weight is duplicated. So the infant duplicates his birth weight at the 4 months of age. At the end of the first year, the birth weight is triplicate. So the infant triplicate his birth weight at one year of age. So this triangle representing the first year of life. This line representing the first four months. This line representing the second four months. This line representing the third four months. The rate of increase in the first four months is about 750 gram per month. The rate of increase in the second four months is about 500 grams per month. And the rate of increase in the third four months is about 250 grams per month. So this is the parameters in the first year of life. It is important to know the birth weight, which is 3, 3 to 3.5 kilograms, and when it duplicate and when it triplicate. After the first year of life, we can rely on this equation, the weight in kilograms equal to the age in years multiplied by 2 plus 8. So I can simply identify what is the normal for age? What is the normal weight for age? We will come later on to what's most important uh, uh, item, which is the gross chart. We'll come to later, inshallah. This is the weight. The second most important is the height. The height and the lens. What's the difference between the lens and the height? The lens is measuring the lens of the child, the height recumbent, and the height is the lens, is the standing lens measuring the lens while standing. But the difference between both of them, the lens is more than the height by about two centimeters. 
as we agreed before, we have to know the normal, then to know the abnormal. What is the normal for the lens? The lens at birth equal 50 centimeters. At the end of the first year, it reached about 75 centimeters. The rate of increase in the first six months of life is 2 point centimeters per month. And the rate of increase in the second six months of life is 1.25 centimeter per month. An important area. After the first year, we can rely on an equation. The length in centimeter or the height in centimeter equal to age in years multiplied by 5 plus 80. This is the crude idea to get the normal length or the normal height. Another important point regarding the length and the height, which will be beneficial when identifying a patient with short stature and to classify the short statures. The upper segment and the lower segment are not uniform throughout life. What's meant by the upper segment? The upper segment is the distance between the crown to the symphysis pubis. And the lower segment is the distance between the symphysis pubis to the heel. At birth, the upper segment is taller or larger than the lower segment. The ratio is about 1.7 1, 1 to 1. At the three years age, it is about 1.3 to 1. At seven years, it is about 1 to 1. This may be important in classifying short stature later on. We will classify it as proportional short stature or disproportional short statures. This is the second important point after the weight. This was the height and length. The third most important item in the anthropometric measures is the head circumference. The head circumference carrying more importance than the width and the height, especially in the first years of life. Do you think why? It seems logic, because it reflects the growth of the brain. The head circumference at birth is equal 35 centimeters. At six months of age, it reach about 43 centimeters, and at the end of the first year, it reach 47 centimeters. So during the first year of life, it is about 12 centimeter increment in the head circumference. 12 centimeter increment over the 12 months. But it is not uniform. It is not one centimeter increment every month, no. In the first four months of life, the rate of increase of the head circumference, 1.5 centimeter per month. In the second four months of life, the rate of increment is one centimeter per month. And in the last four months, in the first year of life, the rate of increment is 0.5 centimeter per month. So in the first four months of life, it increased about six centimeter. In the second four months of life, it increased about four centimeters. In the last four months of the first year, it increased about two centimeters. You notice this is the most important increment. On the second year of life, only two centimeters during the second year of life increment. At the age of five years, it's about 50, only one centimeter increase. And at the 12th year of life, about 55 centimeters, only five centimeter increase. This is an important issue. Yes, it's very important because the head circumference reflected the brain growth. So if we have any abnormalities, the abnormality is either large head or a small head. Large head, there are certain diseases we're causing this large head. We'll discuss it later. And small head, there are certain diseases we'll call this a small head. The fourth item in the anthropometric measures is the mid-arm circumference. This is valid only in the first four years of life. The mid-arm is the area between the shoulder joint and the elbow joint, midway. We have to measure it. What are the normal values in the first four years of life? From 12 to 14 centimeters, this is considered normal. If I find it from 10 to 12 centimeters, this is an impending malnutrition. If it is from 9 to 10 centimeters, this is established malnutrition. If it is less than 9 centimeters, this is a severe form of malnutrition. However, we will use the gross chart, inshallah, to check uh, how can I identify acute malnutrition and its severity, and how can I identify chronic malnutrition and its severity. But this is a simple way if you don't have the gross chart. Another aspect or another domain of the gross chart, we agreed about we have four domains. The first one was the fontanelle, teething, anthropometrics, and osseous growth. We talked about anthropometric measures. We talked about the weight, which is normal. We talked about the height and length. We talked about head circumference, and we talked about the mid-arm circumference. Remember, the weight, in the first year of life, this is a triangle. We have to know the weight at birth, when it duplicate, and when it triplicate. And after the first year, this is an equation. And the height and length, at birth, 50 centimeter. And at the end of the first year, how much is it? And after that, by the equations. 
For the head circumference, it's important to know the head circumference at first. This is reminding you. And they made arm circumference, which is normal and which is impending malnutrition and the established malnutrition. Another aspect of uh, uh, growth is the osseous maturation. We have six ossific centers at birth. We don't like to know about it as a pediatrician, but we know there are ossific centers appear at birth. The most important one regarding the carpal bones. We all know that we have eight carpal bones arranged in two rows with uh, menomonic that soha lazim tilab box takes up texar kullo hals. You know about this. Scaphoid, leonate, triquetrum, biziform, uh, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamid. This is out of the scope of our pediatrics uh, uh, science. But the notice is the first bone is the scaphoid bone. It appear this ossification center appear at the six months of age, and then the second bone appear at the one year of age, and after that it goes irregularly every year. So we could calculate the age. There is a relation between the chronological age and the, the number of carpal bone. This is the equations. What we call it the bone age. The bone age roughly is the number of carpal bones. The bone age equal to chronological age plus one. So if I have a child four years old, how many carpal bones should have? Five carpal bones. If I have a child two years old, how many carpal bones should they have? Three carpal bones. If I have a child 10 years old, how many carpal bones should he have? Eight carpal bones only, because this is the total number. Suppose I have a child four years old and supposed to have five carpal bones. And unfortunately, I found seven carpal bones. What does it mean? This means that there is accelerated or advanced bone age. Suppose if I have a child four years old and is supposed to have five carpal bones and I found he has only two carpal bones. That's what's called the retarded bone age. So bone age is an important issue. The normal, I know the normals, the bone age, the number of carpal bone roughly, this is equal to chronological age plus one. So the abnormal, either the bone age is retarded or the bone age is advanced. And there is a list of diseases causing retarded bone age and another list causing advanced bone age. This, you should know about this. Because I will ask you later on, how many ages do we know? We know the chronological age, we know the bone age now, we know the developmental age, and we know the mental age. This is the bone age. Don't panic. But bone age, what about bone age? This is simply, this is simply the number of carpal bones. And we can use it in the gross chart and in the short stature. It's a very important area. Regarding the third domain or the third aspect of growth is teething. We have two types of teeth. All of us know about this. The milk teeth or the deciduous teeth. The milk teeth, the total number of milk teeth is about 20. And the total number of permanent teeth is about 32. The most important issue here to know to be known by the pediatrician is that the first deciduous tooth to appear is the central lower incisor, and it usually appears at the age of six months. And in comparison, the first permanent tooth to appear is the first premolar, and it appears at six years. So this is the, the, the first cobbling. This is at six months. We started the first deciduous teeth, and at six years, we started the first permanent teeth. All of us know the difference between the milk and the permanent teeth. The milk teeth is white, weak, uh, but the permanent teeth is a strong, bigger, and yellowish. Bigger? Yes, we know about this. This is a medical legal point, may, may be important may, to show us the beauty of the medicine. If we have a human bite, we can judge this human bite is related to child, child bite, or adult bite. You know the canine? usually more deeper uh, uh, than other tooth. If I found that the intercanine distance is less than three centimeters, this is usually child bite. If I found the intercanine distance is more than three centimeters, this is usually an adult bite. This is from the point that the milk teeth is smaller, but the permanent tooth is bigger, larger. This is an important point. Another important point regarding teething, this is the normal. The first tooth to appear is the first, is the central lower incisor, which appeared at the age of six months. When I consider the child abnormal, when I consider delayed teething, at seven months, eight months, ten months, no. I consider delayed teething and should be investigated if the patient reaching one year without any teething. So the normal is first tooth appear at six months, around the age of six months. But I give him a chance for another six months. 
Okay. If reaching 11 to 12 months of age without any teething, this is abnormal. This is delayed teething. And what are the causes behind this? There are a list of long causes. causes. Maybe general causes or maybe local causes. We will come later on to the general causes. But here, the local causes, like what? Maybe the gum is rigid. Maybe there is supernumerary teeth. Maybe there is a cyst between the tooth and the gum, causing a delayed eruption of teeth. So an important point, when a mother comes to you, said that there is no tooth in my infant's mouth. So you have to ask her, what about his age? Oh, he is about eight months old. Oh, wait, wait. Still, he does not fulfill the criteria of delayed teething. He may erupt at any time till the age of the first year, inshallah. This is regarding teething. This is an important question usually asked by the parents. Also, another problem we may face it every now and then. What's, what, what's the difference between natal and neonatal teeth? We may find a newborn infant at delivery have tooth, one or two tooth, one on two lower incisors. This is what's called natal teeth. And what about the neonatal teeth? Surprisingly, we may find a newborn infant at any time in the neonatal period may erupt one or two tooth, usually the central lower incisors. What is the problem behind this? The question is, should we remove it or should we keep it? Before deciding this, we have to do a panorama to check if there is root for this tooth or no. If there is no root, it is better to be removed because it may be lost and may give rise to aspiration. If there is root, you can keep it. That's what's called natal or neonatal teeth or some, by some uh, localities, they call it green teeth because it's slightly greenish in color. So this is regarding the teething. The teething or the third main domain of the growth and development. Again, this is the main slide for this book today. This is the, the, the teething we talked about. I remind you, milk teeth or deciduous teeth and permanent teeth. 20, 32 in numbers. The first one starts at six months. The first one starts at six years. When delayed teething, at one year without any teeth. The anthropometric measures. What was the weight, the height, the head circumference, and the mid-arm circumference? Osseous gross, to remind you again, this is the bone age. Roughly, this is the, the number of carpal bones and the equation, the bone age equal to the chronological age plus one. What about the fontanelles? The fontanelles is simply the area of uh, where the sutures meet together. We have six numbers, six fontanelles, one anterior, one posterior, two anterolaterals, and two posterolaterals. But the most important one is the anterior and the posterior fontanelle. This is very important because it is easy to access and they give rise a lot of information about underlying disorders, especially about the brain and the intracranial area. The anterior fontanelle is the site of meeting of sagittal suture, two coronal suture, and the frontal suture. So it is rhomboid in shape, it is diamond in shape. Usually at birth, what is the normal? It admitted tip of three fingers at birth. And every six months, one finger come out. So it usually close at the age of 18 months of age. This is the normal range. Normally, it is flat, not bulging, nor depressed. So what are the abnormalities we may find? We may find the anterior fontanelle very wide. There is a list of disease causing this. May find it very narrow or closed at birth may find it bulging fontanelle, may find it depressed fontanelle. There are a lot of diseases causing each one of these abnormalities. So I have to know the fontanelle, this fontanelle, how to palpate the fontanelle. Is it normal or abnormal? And if it is abnormal, what is the abnormalities are there? Is it widely opened? Is it closed or narrow? Is it bulging? Is it depressed? This is the most important item, because simply when you put your hand over the head of a child or head of an, of an infant, you can get a lot of information. You can tell the mother, oh, this is the anterior fontanelle, it's bulging fontanelle. So there are increased risk of increased intracranial tension. This is by simple maneuver. What about the posterior fontanelle? The posterior fontanelle is also important. It is the point of meeting of sagittal sutures and two lambdoid sutures. So it is triangular in shape. What are the normal values regarding this posterior fontanelle? Posterior fontanelle normally closed at birth. But there is a normal range. It may be opened but no more than 0.5 cm in diameter and no more than two months. So when the posterior fontanelle is considered abnormal, if it is more than 0.5 cm in diameter, whatever the age, 
or persist over than two months of age, whatever the size. What abnormality is causing this posterior fontanel to be opened or to be abnormal? Usually two diseases, either hydrocephalus or hypothyroidism. This is a very important point also. Simple maneuver to detect serious diseases. If I'm going to palpate the head of an infant and I find the posterior fontanel that is still opened, and the infant is more than two months of age or widely open, more than 0.5 centimeter in diameter, I have to suspect either this patient has hydrocephalus or hypothyroidism, and I have to investigate for this. You see, simple maneuvers to discuss serial disease or to suspect serious disease. Again, going back to the main slide. So this is the aspects or the domains of the growth to answer the questions of the parents. Does my child grow normally or grow poorly? I have to assess these areas. I have to assess the anthropometrics. I have to assess the osseous growth. Now we will come to another important point, what's called the gross chart or growth. We will start with the gross pattern first. Growth pattern, we have the physical pattern of growth, neurological pattern of growth, and head uh, pattern of growth, neurological and genital pattern of growth, are different, are opposing each other. The neurological pattern of growth usually increasing to the maximum till the age of two years, then mostly it is a plateau. However, the, neuro the genital pattern of growth usually plateau till the age of 12 years of age, then start to increase. And the physical pattern of growth go diagonal to this. So this is an important point. Another important point, the lymphoid pattern of growth. This is, may have some clinical importance. What is the lymphoid pattern of growth? It increased till the age of four years, then decline. So in the first four years of life, I suspect this infant, this normal infant, has a high rate of lymphoid pattern of growth. Lymphoid tissues grow highly in the first four months of life. What is the clinical significance of this? Ah, yes, it carries a clinical significance because if the patient, if the infant in the first four years of life developed an infection, he may respond to this infection by lymphocytosis and hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. When I'm going to check or to assess his CBC picture, usually the lymphocytes dominating in the first four years of life. Don't worry, this is normal. But after the, first, after the fourth years of life, the polymorphic nuclear leukocyte is dominating. So this is another important point. Another point regarding the adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy. If it is done in the first four years of life and it was incomplete, so the remnants of the adenoid and the remnants of the tonsil may grow up again to another adenoid or another tonsils because the lymphoid pattern of growth is high during this period. So it is better and it is wise to postpone adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy after the fourth years of life. We will come to another important point which is the gross charts. Gross charts is a very important item to assess the development. The items we discussed before in the absence of gross chart. I should know the birth weight, when duplicate, when triplicate, and the equation after the first year of life. Regarding the height, the birth length at the age of one year, the length at the age of one year, then after that by the equation. Regarding the head circumference, I should know the parameters, shown at the numbers. But regarding gross chart, what's meant by gross chart? Gross chart is called the percentile curve or centile curve. What does it mean? We brought about 100 apparently healthy infants or newborn or children and measure the parameters every now and then according to the different age. For example, we brought 100 apparently healthy newborn and we measured the weight serially over after three months, after six months, after 12 months, after 18 months. And we have a lot of readings. The lower three reading and the, the upper three reading, we discard it. So we got this curve. This curve is the age versus the weight. This is one, this is the first one. And this one, this is the age versus the length. So here we have the age of the infant or the age of the newborn, and this is the weight in kilograms. Any reading between this lower line and the upper line considered normal reading. Any reading below this line considered abnormal. Any reading above this line considered abnormal. However, regarding the normal, this dark line, this bold line is the median. This is the average. 
This is the best. So an important point to know about this. Those are apparently healthy 100 infants. When I'm talking about the normal readings, this bold line is considered the median reading. This is the average reading. So as we said before, this is the age and this is the weight in kilograms. So I am checking the weight over the age. This is I am checking the length over the age. So how can I use this chart? Let us see another example for the charts. The charts are there. This is weight for height or weight for length. And this is the head circumference for age. And this is weight for stature. Stature equal to the height. This is weight for length. And this is weight for the height. We know before the, uh, the difference between the, the length and the height. And there is another uh, graph chart for the body mass index of the, of the age for boys, for girls, and for different ages. The important point, how can I use this gross chart and what does it mean? So the question, the raised up question is single reading interpretation is better or multiple readings is better? We will start first with single reading. I have an infant, I have a child and only I weight him today. How can I use the gross chart? I have an infant, I have a child and I have one reading for the head circumference. How can I plot it on the chart and what is the interpretation? What is the importance? I have an infant or a child and I have one reading regarding his length or height. How can I interpret it? So, single reading. This is again, this is the chart. This is the weight for age. And this is the length or the height for age. For sure, we know that there are charts for girls and boys. We have charts for different ages in the first 36 months of life and by years up to 12 years of life. No gross charts after 12 years of life. Because do you remember that the adolescent period or the adolescence start from the 12th year to the 15 years of life and characterized by rapid physical, rapid psychological and physiological changes. These changes could not be adjusted. So we have gross charts up to the age of 12 years of life. So if I'm going to use a single reading, as here, this is the age of my child, and this is the weight. When I'm coming to the age, then check the weight, have a perpendicular line from the weight, another perpendicular line from the age. When both lines meet together, I put a dot. This is the dot. Another one, another child, when I checked the weight for the age, the dot was here. Another child, when I checked the weight versus the age, the dot, the meeting point was here. What does it mean? For this one, this means underweight. His weight is below the third centile. And for this one, this means overweight. His weight over the 97th centile. This one means normal weight. What about normal weight? If the reading is here, does it differ from the reading is here? Does it differ from the reading is here? Yes. If the reading is here, I can go with the line. This is the 50th centile. If the reading is here, I can go with the line. This is the 25th centile. If the reading is here, I can go with the line. This is the 10th centile. What does it mean? How can I translate this to the parents? When the patient is at the 50th centile, that does, what does it mean? When I'm going to rank this child or this infant between those 100 normal individuals, I will put him number 15. What does it mean when the infant weight is about 25th centile? When I'm going to rank this infant between this 100 normal reading, I will put him number 25. So what does it mean? There are 25 reading, normal reading behind him. What about if my child or if my infant had a weight centile about 90%, 90 percentile? When I'm going to rank him, I will put him number 90. So there are 90 normal reading behind him. So this is an important point. So from single reading, I can say this is underweight, this is overweight, this is normal weight. And for those normal weight, I can check. This is 25th centile, 50th centile, 75th centile, 95th centile, etc. And I know what does it mean? This is an important point. Okay, if I have, suppose that I have 100 infant, carrying each one carrying his normal reading. So I'm going to put my infant or my child in between them. Where can I put him? Number 25th, number 50, 
number 75, number 90, or I'll put him away, or I'll put him over in front. This is the, the, the rationale behind this cross chart. Usually, the normal infant or the child, the normal individual, will start, if, we, if he started here, for example, he has to follow his own trajectory. He has to go through this line. If there is any deviation, deviation down, deviation up, this is abnormal. How can I get this? From multiple readings. So this, how can I use the growth chart with single reading? Again, okay, I, we saw before different charts. Weight for age, height for age, weight for height, head circumference, BMI for age. So if I'm going to assess acute malnutrition assessment, if I'm going to check these patients may be malnourished, acutely malnourished, which chart I have to use? And how can I get the severity of this acute malnutrition? For acute malnutrition, the best chart to use is the weight for height. The weight versus the height. Because we know that the acute malnutrition will affect the weight rather than the height. The lens or the height affected later on, after usually six months of the problem. So in acute malnutrition, the weight is retarded more than the height. So I can use the weight for the height curve. How can I use the curve to assess the severity of acute malnutrition? I can say this infant has acute malnutrition, mild. Another one, acute malnutrition, moderate. Another one, acute malnutrition, severe. How can I use it? Look at the chart. This is the weight of the patient, of our patient, was here, the yellow one. And this is the height or the length of our patient. This is the yellow one. Okay, this is an important, but I will check the lens. This lens, what is the proper weight for this lens? How can I get it? I can go horizontally to meet the 50 centile. Then I go down to find the proper weight for the age. So this is what's called median weight for the lens. Median weight for the height. Okay? Again, this is the normal, this is the actual weight of the child. And this is the actual height of the child. But this height, what is the proper weight for this height? Can go horizontally to meet the 50 centile and go down to find the normal weight for that height. So now I had two parameters, two weight, the actual weight and the median weight for the height. I can check how far is the actual weight from the median weight for the height. The actual weight, if it is more than 90% of the median weight for the height, this is normal. If it is from 80 to 90%, this is mild malnutrition. Is it from 70 to 80%? This is moderate malnutrition. If the actual weight is less than 70% of the median weight for height, this is the severe malnutrition. Simply, how far is this actual weight from the proper weight? If it is near, so this is mild malnutrition. It is far, moderate malnutrition. Is this long far, this is severe form of malnutrition. So if I'm going to assess a child, the problem with about with still within six months of age, this is acute state, and the patient losing weight. So mostly this is acute malnutrition. What chart should I use? The first chart I use is the weight for height. Okay? Suppose for this chart, if I put the weight here, and the height here, and I make a cross between them, perpendicular line from the weight, to meet another perpendicular line from the lens, and they meet together here. What does it mean? This means this curve is normal, but not necessarily this infant is normal because the weight may be reduced to the same degree to the height. So interpretation of this curve is better used after using weight for age and the height for age. But for sure, if I'm going to assess acute malnutrition again, this curve is the best. Weight for height. But don't panic, don't surprise. If you find this weight, and the lens meets together at the 50 centile. Does it mean he's normal? No, not necessarily. Because the reduction of weight may be equal to the reduction of height. But usually in the acute malnutrition, the reduction of weight is much more than the reduction of height. 
So in assessing the acute malnutrition status, this curve is the most beneficial. And they can say this is acute, mild, moderate, or severe, according to how far the actual weight go far away from the median weight for the height. Okay? Another issue, chronic malnutrition assessment. If I have a child with chronic malnutrition, which chart should I use to identify his chronic malnutritional status? And how can I assess the severity? How can I say this child has chronic malnutrition mild form, chronic malnutrition moderate form, chronic malnutrition severe form? Yes, the chart should be used is the height for age chart, this one. How can I use it and how can I assess the severity? Yes, this is the age of the patient, the yellow dot. And this is the height of the patient, the yellow dot. Okay? I am using, I am checking the chronic malnutrition. And which parameter usually affected by chronic malnutrition is the length or the height. So I have to determine the normal length for that age. So I will give a, a perpendicular line from that age to meet the 50 centile for the height curve, then go horizontally to find the appropriate length for that age. So now again, I have two readings. This is the actual length of the infant. And this is the median length for the age, the proper length for his age. And again, I have to check how far is the actual length from the proper length. If the actual length more than 95% of the proper length, what you call it median length for height or height length, height length for age, this is normal. If it is from 90 to 95%, this is mild form. If it is 85 to 90, this is moderate. If it is less than 85%, this is a severe form of chronic malnutrition. This is how to use the charts to assess I have a single reading and I have to assess the child. If the infant or the child is normal or he's abnormal. And if he's abnormal, is it acute malnutrition or is it a, a chronic malnutrition? And if it is acute malnutrition, is it mild or moderate or severe? And if it is chronic malnutrition, is it mild or moderate or severe? Again, I will go back again to the gross chart, the first one. This is the single reading assessment. This is underweight. This is Normal weight at the 50th centile, and I know what does it mean, and this is overweight above the 97th centile. Okay? And this is the chart to use, to be used to assess the acute malnutritional status. This is the weight for height, and how can I use it? And to assess the chronic malnutrition, this is the chart of the age for height, and we know how to assess it. The another questions, which is better, single or multiple readings? Before answering these questions, let us check this curve. This curve, what is this curve? This is the age versus weight. So this is weight age curve, weight for age curve. What are these parameters? These are different values we may find. We may find this one, this is the weight. After six months, this is the weight. After six months, this is the weight. What is this? No increment at all. Another form. This is the weight, increase after six months, increase after six months, but still below the third centile. Another one, this is the weight, after six months, this is the weight, after six months, this is the weight. This is increasing and in carrying his own trajectory. Another one, this is the weight, after six months increased, after another six months, much more increased. This is crossed up two major percentile lines. Another one, this is the weight, after six months, this is the, the value, and after six months, this is the value. This patient is still in the normal area, but he is declining. So how can I interpret this? And this chart will give us the importance of graph velocity, taking multiple readings. So this child or this infant, if I relied on one reading only, I will say this infant is normal. Even if this, if this is the reading I have, so I will find him, this is at the, at the 50 centile. This is a good infant. Actually, he is not a good infant. He is failing to thrive. He is going down. 
his growth velocity crossing down two major percentile line. This is not good. Another issue, this one, this is the reading, another reading, another reading. The infant may find, if I, am, I, I, I rely on single reading, this is normal infant, but he's not. He is crossing up two major percentile line. This infant is accelerating the growth, which is abnormal. This infant is failing to thrive, which is abnormal. This infant is increasing in the weight, but the increase in the weight is not satisfactory. So he's failing to thrive. This infant has an arrested growth. So which of these parameters is normal? This only, the yellow one only. But the other, all the other parameters are abnormal. That's why the importance of the growth velocity. The growth velocity is to taking serial measurements and to plot it on the chart. So from these measurements, I can say this one, this one, and this one are failing to thrive. So I can have a definition of failure to thrive. So what is the definition? The patient, there is slow, steady, weight, gain, pot blue, the third percentile. The patient has an arrested growth. Or the patient weight crossing down two major percentile lines. What are the major percentile lines? The lines are drawn here in the chart. The 10th centile, 25th centile, 50th centile, 75th centile, and the 95th centile. So if the patient is crossing down two major percentile line, this is considered abnormal. And if he is going in the way, this is the highway. If he go to the right or to the left, crossing two lines, this is abnormal. Okay, so gross velocity is much more important than single reading. However, I can utilize both. If I only have a single reading, I can plot the child on the curve and say this is blue or this is above, this is under, this is over, or this is normal and how normal he is. And if I have multiple readings, this is an important. Few another questions usually raised by the parents. After how long can I take the second reading? I checked the weight now. When I come back to take the second reading, this is variable. Reading regarding the weight, the minimal interchanging period is one week. Regarding the length, the minimal interchanging period is four weeks. Regarding the height, the minimal interchanging period is eight weeks. Regarding the head circumference in the first year of life, the minimal interchanging period is one week. But after the first year of life, the minimal interchanging period is four weeks. This is important? Yes. So if I have a child has failure to thrive, I can take a period of one week giving this child high calories and recheck the weight again. If there is no suitable increment in the weight, I can plot this child as mostly have a malabsorption and I have to check for the malabsorption syndrome. So the period is one week. This is the minimal interchanging period. Okay, so this is how to use the gross chart for the velocity. What about this chart? This chart is the gross velocity, but not for the weight. For the height. How can I interpret this chart? You look here to the left. Those two parameters, those this blue line and this red line, red dashes. This is a short newborn. Here, short infant. This is till the two years of life. Still here after two years of life. Still short child. Here, still short adult. So, short newborn, short infant, short child, short adult, this is either prenatal cause of short stature or familiar short stature. You have familiar short stature or prenatal cause of short stature, usually short newborn, short infant, short child, and short adult. We have another scenario. If we have normal newborn, normal infant, Normal early childhood, but short adult. What does it mean? This means postnatal pathological short stitch. If we have another scenario, normal newborn, short infant, short child, but normal adult. This is constitutional short stitch. So I have when I'm going to check the gross velocity regarding the height or regarding the length, I have to check. What about at birth? The starting point, 
the point of beginning. Was he short or was he normal? He was short in newborn. Okay, so I have to check regarding the infancy at the second year of life. How was it be? In the, child, in the childhood period and in the adult period. Usually those who are short uh, at birth, usually will continue to be short at infant, short in, uh, child and short adult. Except if there is an intratrangular retardation factor which is corrected, what's called the catch-up phenomena. Those catch-up phenomena, infant delivered, but was found to be underweight. But the cause was uh, placental defects, for example. And the patient has good nutrition after delivery, so he can catch up his weight. And usually, the weight catch-up is fulfilled and achieved at the end of the second year. Okay? But if the patient continue to be short in newborn, short infant, short child, and short adult, so this may be either familiar short stature or prenatal cause of short stature. When a newborn infant was normal, then check. At the end of the infancy, still normal, carrying the same rate, and following the same trajectory, this is good, this is normal. And after that, he starts to decline, so mostly this is a postnatal cause of short stature. If the infant was normal at birth, regarding the length, and declining at the end of infancy, to be short infant, short child, then near adolescence, he increased up and he catch up. This is the constitutional form of short stitch. Again, failure to thrive. What does it mean by failure to thrive? As we said before, remember the curve. Remember the percentile curve. This, I will uh, show it to you again. This one, failing to thrive. This one, failing to thrive. And this one, failing to thrive. So the definition of failure to thrive is, yes, slow, steady weight gain, but below the third percentile, or arrested growth. Okay, what are, uh, this is the chart again. This is for the failure to thrive alone. All these are abnormal. Regarding failure to thrive, I have to ask some questions. Is it primary or secondary? What does it mean primary or secondary? Failure to thrive may be primary. The starting point was poor. Birth weight was low. This is the primary form of failure to thrive. So to answer these questions, I have to ask about the birth weight. Is it normal or abnormal? Normal birth weight, and the infant is failing to thrive, this is means the secondary cause. Abnormal birth weight, and the infant is failing to thrive, this is a primary failure to thrive. This is, there are a primary cause. This is an important differential point, because primary failure to thrive, I have to check the intrauterine environment. Secondary failure to thrive, I have to check the other systems, the postnatal environment. So I will come to this after. And the second cause, what is the degree of growth failure? We know the degree before. Is it acute malnutritional status or chronic malnutritional status? So we can assess is it mild or moderate or severe. What is the pattern of growth failure? Stunted, wasted, or dwarf? And what are the causes of growth failure? This is example for the causes of failure to thrive. Primary failure to thrive, the infant or the child is failing to thrive with abnormal birth weight. So what, what is the cause? Either prematurity, so in the prematurity, all parameters are affected. The weight, the length, and the head circumference. Or intratrine gross retardation. Intratrine gross retardation, either the problem, either in the placenta or in the fetus itself. If the problem is in the placenta, there is an old term, what's called dismaturity. So the parameters affected when the placental defect or disorder the placental circulation is the weight and the length, but the head is characteristically spurred. The problem may be in the fetus itself, altered growth potential chromosomal disorders, congenital infections, congenital anomalies. This is what's called before hypoplastic infant and all parameters are affected. The weight, the lens, and the head cell come. So it is easy. If I find a child with failure to thrive and the birth weight was low, the first question to ask, what about, was he premature? What about the gestational age? Oh yes, he was full term. So I'm talking about intrauterine gross retardation. Either the problem was in the placenta, placental defect, Abruptio placenti, pre premature placental separation, vasoconstriction of the placental vessels, the mother the hypertensive, the mother is malnourished, placental disorders. This is called the dismature infant, or the problem in the fetus itself. Alter the growth potential and the other disorders affecting the fetal period. So this is what's called the hypoplastic infants. To differentiate between uh, 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 dismature or hypoplastic infant, the defect in the placental circulation or in the fetus itself, simply the head circumference may give a clue. 
If the weight is low and the length is low but the head is spared, this is placental defect. If all parameters are low, this is the hypoplastic and this is the fetal defect. What about the secondary failure to thrive? Secondary failure to thrive again, this patient is failing to thrive. How did I know? When I plot it in the chart, the plot series of weight measurements on the chart, I found it fulfilled one of the three criteria as we mentioned before. So he's failing to thrive. And the question is, what about the birth weight? The birth weight was okay. So this is a secondary failure to thrive. 80% of the secondary failure to thrive are non-organic causes due to caloric deficiency, deficient intake, deficient caloric intake, either because of poverty, uh, uh, nutritional imbalance, imbalanced diet, uh, um, the patient does not uh, suck well, the patient does not eat well, whatever. This is the non-organic cause due to malnutrition. Another 20% of the failure to thrive is due to organic cause. However, the most important system to be affected differ. In America and in the Western statistics, they said that the most important organic cause of failure to thrive is renal tubular acidosis. However, from our practice in the Eastern area and in the middle, in the Gulf area, we found that the most important organic cause of failure to thrive is related to the GIT, mostly malabsorption syndrome. So I have to check all the systems if the patient has secondary failure to thrive, checking from the, from the point that if this system has congenital defect or chronic problem. But which system we start with? Usually we start with the GIT. And it seems logic, because the GIT is the system concerned with the caloric input to the body. So you have to check each system regarding the congenital defects or chronic problem. This is the diagnostic workup, simple diagnostic workup to remind you. I have to uh, uh, take a proper history, concentrating on the dietetic history, chronic symptoms affecting any system and family history. However, the other items of the history are important. And in this area, we have to know how can I get the proper dietetic history. It is not sufficient to say this infant is a breastfed infant. Follow stop. That's not proper. You have to check, this is breastfed infant, one or two breasts at a time, for how many times, for how long, is there satisfaction or not. This infant is artificially fed infant, follow stop. This is not a proper dietetic history. Artificially fed infant, which type of formula he used, how, uh, how the mother prepared the formula, is it concentrated or diluted formula, how many times, what about the signs of satisfaction. This patient is eating regular diet with the family. This is not full stop. This is not a proper history. You have to concentrate on the different items of the food stuff. So dietetic history is an important one. We can diagnose several diseases from the proper dietetic history. Suppose, for example, a mother came to you with the patient's underweight or failing to thrive. And when I'm going to discuss with her the dietetic history, she said that I give him breast feeding, but um, unfortunately I have scanty milk. I give him one breast at a time for about five minutes, only two to three times per day without supplementation. So this is the problem. The problem is here. This is poor dietetic history. Another one talking about artificial formula. The mother talking about this patient feeling to thrive or underweight, and she is giving a formula, X formula. For example, S26, for example. How can you prepare the formula? She is saying that. I put 120 ml water. Nice. And I put three scopes of this milk over. Oh, this is concentrated formula. This will lead the child to have diarrhea and failing to thrive. Another one. I put 120 ml water. And I put one scope only of the formula. This is diluted formula. This is the cause, the main cause behind this failure to thrive. So important questions, important items to know about it can diagnose and can save a lot of investigation, can save money and save time. Examination, we concentrate on the abnormal features. If there is abnormal urinary odor, chest and cardiac and abdominal examination, however, all items of examinations are important. This is for example, investigations, we investigate basic investigations and we concentrate on the investigations on the system affected. We can identify the system affected from the history and from the, the ex clinical examination. Karyotyping should be done, uh, 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 urea and creatinine, blood gases, and according to the system affected. Again, back again, 
to the pretest and we'll answer it together after the lecture. Regarding teething and walking, which start first? Teething start first. Head body ratio is larger in newborn or child or adult. It is larger in newborn. You know that the head represent in the neonatal period, the head represent about one fourth of the body size. But in the adult, the head represents about 1 over 25 of the body size. This is important issue? Yes. What is the importance of behind this? The head increase in the neonatal period, this is the most important period for the neurological increment. Another issue, the head is larger in the newborn regarding to his base, in comparison to his, his size rather than the adult. So the hypothermia if you are going to resuscitate a newborn infant, you have to cover the head because this is a wide surface area may give rise to hypothermia if you did not concentrate on this area. Which grow faster in the first year of life? The weight, the height, the same. For sure, the weight. We see that the patient duplicate or the infant duplicate his birth weight at the age of four months and the infant duplicate his birth length at the age of four years. So there's a lot of differences. What is the most critical period of growth and development? For sure, this is the first months of life. Because this is a critical period for neurological development and for the head increment. The most important parameter for growth, it depends. Weight for age, height for age, or weight for height. To assess acute malnutritional status, the weight for height is the best. To assess the chronic malnutritional status, the height for age is the best. Thank you very much.